What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports for the JT Sports Podcast. My bad. Let me start that over, man. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. It's Friday. You know what they call it? Feel Good Friday, Payday Friday. On this episode of the podcast, there are some teams out there going into this NFL season who could be looking to tank. So their tanking efforts could be rewarded and pay off. And the reward of Caleb Williams, who is regarded to be one of the best quarterback prospects ever. We're going to talk about what teams potentially could tank for him this season. The SEC, we know that it's one of the toughest conference, if not the toughest conference in college football. Everybody already knows how good Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, and LSU are going to be. But we're going to talk about some underrated teams that some of you guys may be overlooking going into this year. And lastly, what can you expect from the Los Angeles Chargers' new offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore? If this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome. Make sure that you check us out. The podcast is available on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from. You can find the JT Sports Podcast. Like the stream and subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure that you leave us with a five-star review if you enjoy. Now, many people... Expect Caleb Williams to be the number one overall pick in the 2024 NFL Draft. Then he's regarded by most draft analysts out there to be one of the greatest quarterback prospects ever. He's been getting a lot of comparisons to Patrick Mahomes. And a lot of people were already really high on both Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. But many people expect Caleb Williams to have even more hype than those two guys had coming into this past year's NFL draft. And we're going to be discussing what are some teams that could potentially look to tank for Caleb Williams going into this season. Now, let me lay out what I mean by tanking. I'm not saying teams are going into this year and week one right out the gate, they're going to start trying to tank for Caleb Williams. These teams could start out the season pretty slow and then get to the middle way portion week eight, week nine, and just decide, hey, we're not going to be that good for the remainder of the year. We're just going to chalk it up and try to tank for Caleb Williams. So let's start off with the first team that I have, which are The Arizona Cardinals. The Arizona Cardinals, we know that Kyler Murray is going to miss the first half of the season for Arizona. And when he comes back, the Arizona Cardinals aren't going to have the greatest roster around him in order for him to win and lead them to the postseason or much success this year. They have a new head coach, a new coaching staff, a new general manager. And Kyler Murray wasn't the quarterback who this new regime drafted so when you have a quarterback who's this good of Caleb Williams caliber and you have Kyler Murray who his play kind of has went down over the last couple of seasons plus he's coming off an injury a major injury at that maybe the Arizona Cardinals could look to move on from Kyler Murray and trade him after the season ends and try to draft Caleb Williams if they're in a position to get Caleb Williams now they are expected to have two high draft picks if they do end up becoming the worst team in the NFL this season they basically will end up having the number one overall selection and depending on what the Houston Texans do this year they probably could end up having another top five or top ten pick so you could end up drafting Caleb Williams then maybe you could end up getting Marvin Harrison Jr. out of Ohio State. But when it comes to the possibility of Arizona taking for Caleb Williams, I think that this is a high chance that this could end up happening. Caleb Williams, he could be an upgrade from Kyler Murray. Many people have questions about Kyler Murray's commitment to the game of football when it comes to his study habits. You remember the whole stipulation that they threw into his new contract with him having to watch a certain amount of hours of film, and then they ended up taking it out because it ended up giving Kyler Murray a really bad look. But with this new coaching staff, 
if Kyler Murray ends up not really getting along with the new coaches or the new GM and he ends up not playing all that well, they could look to trade him elsewhere and end up moving on and drafting Caleb Williams. The next team that could be in the realm of trying to tank for Caleb Williams are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mean, have you guys not seen the Buccaneers OTA so far? Kyle Trask and Baker Mayfield look god-awful. I mean, they're overthrowing wide receivers that's running routes on air with no defensive backs. Kyle Trask can't really hit an accurate receiver to save his life so far during OTAs. It's just looking really bad for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback situation going into this year. And the Buccaneers offensive line isn't good neither. Yeah, they have a really good defense and really good wide receivers such as Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, but their quarterback situation could ultimately be the reason why they could be in range to just go ahead and tank for Caleb Williams. And if you get Caleb Williams and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin are still on the roster next season, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, without a doubt, could end up having a really good chance of making it back to the postseason next season if they are able to tank successfully and get that number one overall pick for Caleb Williams. But you just look at the way their quarterback situation looks right now with Baker and Kyle Trask, it definitely looks like they're going to have a really high chance at being able to land Caleb Williams. What about the Las Vegas Raiders, man? There's already many Raiders fans who already want to throw the towel in on this season and just go all in for tanking for Caleb Williams. I've already seen a bunch of tank for Caleb Williams fan pages on Twitter. I've seen some Raiders fans who have their Twitter profile of Caleb Williams in the Las Vegas Raiders jersey photoshopped. So many Raiders fans definitely are on board when it comes to the idea of throwing the towel in on this season and trying to go all in for Caleb Williams. And plus, you look at Jimmy Garoppolo, the dude already isn't fully healthy. When they first tried to sign him, the dude had a nagging injury coming from his late season injury that he suffered with the San Francisco 49ers. So it turns out he actually did need surgery for it the whole time. So Jimmy Garoppolo, he ends up signing with the Raiders and they end up editing the contract to add a addendum to it. So if Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't pass his physical and he's not able to play for the Raiders come week one of the regular season, they could end up releasing him without having to pay him a single dime. So then that could put them in a situation where they might have to start Brian Hoyer or Aiden O'Connell, and they could end up sucking so bad that they could end up having the number one overall pick and getting Caleb Williams. But even if Jimmy Garoppolo plays this year and he is fully healthy going into week one, I don't think he's going to be able to hold up for the full 17 game season. Jimmy Garoppolo during his time with the 49ers, he only played what one season when he was fully healthy. So even if Jimmy G is ready to go come the start of this year, I don't expect the Raiders to be all that good. I don't really see them winning no more than four to five games max. When you look at the AFC West division, you already have Kansas City. You got the LA Chargers who are going to be really good. The Denver Broncos are going to be way better with Sean Payton as their head coach. The Las Vegas Raiders, I don't really see any way they win more than four or five games this year. I don't believe in Josh McDaniels as their head coach. And many Raiders fans feel the same way I feel about this organization right now. So I definitely think out of all the teams who could really end up throwing the white flag at the middle of the season and just saying, F it, let's just go ahead and try to get Caleb Williams. I think the Raiders most definitely could be that team come week eight, week nine. The season isn't going right. People have already lost faith in the locker room and Josh McDaniels. I definitely think the Raiders could be in a situation come the middle half of this season where they just chalk it up and just say, let's just go ahead and try to tank for Caleb Williams. And the last team that I think could tank for Caleb Williams are the Tennessee Titans. And Titans fans, if you're watching this, you're probably going to be really pissed off right now because you're going to be saying, JT, Mike Vrabel is way too good of a head coach for the Titans to be trying to tank for any quarterback. And you are right to an extent. But looking at the Tennessee Titans schedule, man, it's not the easiest. They play some really tough teams 
offensively their offensive line isn't good they don't really have any proven wide receivers they drafted Traylon Burks in the first round of this past year's draft but he hasn't really shown too much promise on the field he has been making a lot of noise so far for Tennessee throughout OTAs but even if he ends up being their number one wide receiver who else is Ryan Tannehill going to be throwing the football to Plus, Ryan Tannehill, he could be at a point of his career where he starts to regress. Now, he may not regress and become one of the worst QBs in the league, but he definitely could regress for, you know, he could end up regressing from a top 13, top 14 QB to becoming, what, a top 20, top 21 quarterback in the league, which would make him a bottom tier starter, almost a fringe starter at this point. And you got to remember that the Titans have drafted a quarterback in the last two drafts. They drafted Malik Willis and just recently they drafted Will Levis. So Will Levis and Malik Willis, neither one of those guys have looked really promising. Will Levis is struggling at OTA so far for Tennessee. And Malik Willis, he's struggling as well. He hasn't really made too much improvement also. So the Tennessee Titans could probably be right around the 2024 NFL draft in a position where they could be eyeing drafting another quarterback, but this time trying to make sure that they go big and walk away with Caleb Williams. And for Tennessee, they also could be a team that late in the year, Mike Vrabel and the general manager get together and they just say, man, like this season isn't going well for us. We're not even close to being able to compete for a playoff spot. So let's just go ahead, chalk up the season. Let's just bench Ryan Tannehill, throw Will Levis or Malik Willis out there, whoever, and let's try to get that number one pick to get Caleb Williams. Now, this isn't really ideally because this isn't something that I don't think Mike Vrabel will be a big fan of, but I think if their general manager guarantees that Mike Vrabel is going to be back as a head coach next season, I could see him on board with that because why would he just want to go out there and continue to lose and then not be in a position to get a franchise QB? Mike Vrabel is a guy that although he is ultra competitive, and even though I'm not expecting Tennessee to be awful when it comes to an on-the-field standpoint, even if they have a bad record where they only win four or five games, most of those games are going to be really close because you know the kind of team Tennessee is. They're a scrappy football team. They're going to fight, claw, and find ways to try to stay with you in games that they have no business being in. You remember how they almost beat Kansas City last year with Malik Willis at QB, and that was on the road in Arrowhead. So for Tennessee, this is a team that I don't think they're going to win a lot of games this year. I definitely expect them to have a really high draft pick next season, but I don't think it's going to be a season where they're just getting blown out and they're not going to be competitive in their games like the Raiders, the Buccaneers, and the Cardinals possibly are going to be. I think Tennessee still has the potential to be good enough where they put themselves in a situation where they're not going to be able to tank for Caleb Williams. That's if Mike Vrabel doesn't want to go ahead and throw in the towel on the season. They just want to try to find a way just to make it to the postseason or just try to be competitive. But ideally, looking at the Titans schedule, I don't really have them winning no more than five to six games max. So I definitely could see them tanking for Caleb Williams. But these are the teams that I think could possibly tank for Caleb Williams this upcoming season. The SEC is the most talented conference in all of college football. We already know about Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and LSU. All four of those teams are expected to be in the college football playoff conversation this season, but there are a good amount of under-the-radar teams that a lot of people kind of aren't talking about. And one of the most underrated teams going into not only this college football season, but also going into the SEC has to be Kentucky, man. Like Kentucky, prior to last season, they were coming off a 10-win season. And then their offensive coordinator at the time, Liam Cohen, he ends up leaving the coaching staff. He goes back to L.A. with Sean McVay for one season. The offense struggles. Will Levis struggles. The offensive line wasn't good. They did have two really good true freshman wide receivers and Dane Key and Baron Brown who returned. But for the most part, 
Their offense last season was just all out of wax. It was just all out of sorts. So they lose Will Levis. They lose star running back Chris Rodriguez. And then they go into the transfer portal and they get former NC State quarterback Devin Leary, who missed a significant amount of last year due to an injury that he suffered, but he's back fully healthy. And prior to him getting injured, he was probably the best quarterback in the ACC. You bring him to Kentucky with Leon Cohen coming back after one year with the Rams. He returns. You're going to be throwing to Dane Key, Baron Brown, which is probably one of the best wide receiver duos going into the SEC this year. Then your offensive line most definitely should be improved because last year was really out of the ordinary when it comes to Kentucky's offensive line. When you think of Kentucky... The first thing that mostly comes to your head is how good their offensive line performs. They probably have one of the most consistent offensive lines year in and year out every single season. So last year for their offensive line to perform the way that they did was a bit of a surprise. And I expect for that to change this season. I expect their offensive line to perform way better than what they did last year. Now, their offensive line may not perform at the level that it was prior to 2022, but I do expect this offensive line to at least be solid this year. Then you already know that their defense is still going to be really good. Kentucky always has one of the better defenses in this conference. I think for Kentucky, they probably have a high chance of competing with Tennessee for the second best team in the SEC East this year. I know that may sound a little bit crazy because a lot of people are really excited about Joe Milton and Josh Heupel going into this year, but Kentucky is definitely a team that you guys need to keep your eyes on for this year, man. This team has some really talented players at wide receiver. You got your guy at quarterback in Devin Leary, who I think is probably going to be better than Will Levis. Will Levis, he wasn't bad, but the dude was really reckless with the football, especially late in games. With Devin Leary, you're going to have somebody who is a better passer, somebody who is way better at reading defenses and doesn't make the same amount of critical mistakes that Will Levis did late last year. Like, do you remember... That Ole Miss game when Will Levis had fun with the football and it sealed the victory for Ole Miss. Those are the kind of mistakes that you're not going to see that often out of Devin Leary at QB. And Mark Stoops is one of the better coaches in college football. He's probably the second most underrated coach in college football at this moment. Right behind Kyle Winningham at Utah. If people still don't really view Kyle Whittingham as being underrated anymore. People are actually giving Kyle Whittingham his credit, then you probably could say Mark Stoops is the most underrated and most underappreciated head coach in college football. But I think Kentucky, out of all these teams that I'm about to list, I think they're probably the most underrated going into this season. What about Auburn, man? A large reason why I'm a little high on Auburn is because of the hiring of head coach Hugh Freeze. We already know what Hugh Freeze has done in the SEC in the past when he was back at Ole Miss before he had all of the allegations that came out that ultimately led to him getting fired and whatnot, scandals, all kinds of stuff was going on at Ole Miss. But during his time there, man, Ole Miss was a real juggernaut at times, man. They gave Alabama and Nick Saban a lot of problems. And Auburn, they hit the transfer portal Pretty hard, man. They brought in former Michigan State quarterback Peyton Thorne. Yeah, a lot of us are still rooting for Robbie Ashford, but hopefully Robbie Ashford ends up getting the starting nod come next season. Peyton Thorne most definitely should be an upgrade from what Auburn has had at quarterback in the past. And Peyton Thorne, you probably could make the argument and say that he's probably the best QB that this program has had since what, Jarrett Stidham? And even Jared Stidham wasn't really lighting the world on fire. So I think Peyton, Storm, Peyton Thorne is going to give Hugh Freeze some stability at QB this year. Their wide receiving core is pretty good. They got a couple of pretty good offensive linemen out of the portal. I don't really know what we're going to be getting out of their defense, but they do have a couple of good players on the defense side of the football, such as star cornerback DJ James, who is one of the best cornerbacks in college football going into this year. And for Auburn, 
I don't think people are expecting them to compete for the SEC West, but they definitely could exceed expectations and be a lot better than what people are expecting them. Right now, they have an over-under win total of six and a half. This is definitely a team that could end up winning seven, maybe eight games this year. They could pull off an upset or two because you know Hugh Freeze is really good at that. He's really good at giving some of those top teams in this conference a lot of issues with how good he is at scheming things up on the off the side of the football so I think Auburn definitely is an underrated team that you need to look out for in the SEC this season and then you have Texas A&M man now Texas A&M probably wouldn't fit the criteria of being underrated in most people's eyes but they're underrated in my opinion, because most people, when you ask them how they feel about Texas A&M going into this year, they expect them to bounce back, but they probably think they're going to win somewhere between eight to nine games. But I'm expecting Texas A&M to actually be competing for the SEC West title this year, man. Like they have a roster that's just as good as LSU's. Now they may be a tad bit below Alabama, from a talent standpoint, but I definitely think they have more than enough talent to be able to win the SEC West this year. And plus, Jimbo Fisher, he's a pretty solid head coach. The only thing he needs to do is let Bobby Petrino cook and let Bobby Petrino call the plays on offense. As long as Bobby Petrino is calling the plays for this offense this year with Connor Wigman at QB. I think there's no reason why Texas A&M shouldn't be competing for the SEC West title. I definitely think that this is the year Texas A&M could be popping off. Like many people in years prior have always been really high when it comes to the Aggies. And most of the times, they don't really live up to those level of expectations. Last year, the offensive line dealt with a lot of injuries. The QB play wasn't good. You couple that with Jimbo Fisher's play calling, which he kind of has lost his touch there. Texas A&M this year, though, not too many people are really viewing them as a team that can legitimately push for the SEC West title this year. They're a team that has the talent to be able to go toe-to-toe with Alabama, LSU, and be one of the best teams in this conference. And I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing Texas A&M in the SEC championship this season, man. Like, that's just how much confidence I have in Bobby Petrino. Bobby Petrino, everywhere he's been, in Division One college football, his offenses have produced. This is somebody who helped develop Lamar Jackson at Louisville. And ultimately, Lamar Jackson ended up winning the Heisman Trophy under Bobby Petrino's tutelage. Remember Ryan Mallett, Arkansas legend Ryan Mallett? Yeah, Bobby Petrino had a large part in his development. So with Connor Wigman, Jimbo Fisher, not too long ago when Connor Wigman had first committed to Texas A&M and then he signed his national letter of intent to play for the Aggies on national early signing day I believe Jimbo Fisher actually came out and said that he believed that Connor Wigman was the best quarterback coming out of that recruiting cycle and when you look at what Connor Wigman did at times last season for Texas A&M he looked pretty good at times now he did have some bad games but for the most part I like what I saw out of Connor Wigman in his freshman season starting for the Aggies and going into this year with him having a way better play caller at the helm calling the plays and you already have a really good group of wide receivers there's no reason why this Texas A&M offense shouldn't improve now their defense is stout their defensive line is really good their secondary is really good your only concerns that you have with Texas A&M is going to be how are the linebackers going to do but ultimately I think Texas A&M is underrated because I think for the most part, people view them as a team that's going to win eight, nine games. I don't think too many people are giving Texas A&M the benefit of the doubt that they're going to be able to compete for the SEC West title this season. But I think there's a strong possibility we could see them in Atlanta come conference championship week in the SEC championship game. That's how much confidence I have in Connor Wigman and Bobby Petrino. Now, Bobby Petrino doesn't end up calling the plays, and Jimbo Fisher still has somewhat of his hands in the cookie jar, and he's controlling the offense. I don't think Texas A&M is going to go all that far this year. I'm really just having a lot of faith in Bobby Petrino as a play caller. And the last team is Ole Miss. This is probably... 
one of the most talented teams that Lane Kiffin has had during his time at Ole Miss. I mean, you have Quinshawn Juckins, who was the best running back in college football last year. He had over 1,500 rushing yards, 16 touchdowns. He was averaging nearly six yards per carry behind one of the best offensive lines in college football. This is an offensive line that returns four out of five starters. Their offensive tackle situation is phenomenal. Both of their two tackles are most likely going to be playing on Sundays. The wide receiver group is really good, even though I'm really hurt about what happened with receiver Chris Marshall. I wish he would have had his act together because if he would have been able to play for Ole Miss this season and he never got booted off the team, he would have had a really fantastic season in that Lane Kiffin system. But despite losing him, They're not too shabby at wide receiver. They return slot receiver Jordan Watkins. You have transfer wide receiver out of Louisiana Tech, Trey Harris, who last year for Louisiana Tech, he had 65 receptions, 935 receiving yards, and he also caught 10 touchdown passes. He was a first-team Conference USA selection. And then you got Dayton Wade who returns. He gives you some depth there. A lot of Rebels fans are really excited about tight end Michael Trigg. Some Ole Miss fans think that he can end up becoming the second best tight end in this conference this season behind Brock Bowers. Now, I don't really know about the defense. They got Pete Golding, who left Alabama to come coach under Lane Kiffin. I'm not really a big fan of his defenses. His defenses weren't really good during his time at Alabama. And I'm not really expecting the defense to improve all that much, even though I don't think your defense can be any worse than what it was last year for Ole Miss. So I think for Pete Golden, you know, maybe there's a chance that this defense makes instrumental improvement. Maybe he goes back and he watches the tape and he changes some things around. But for the most part, I'm banking on Ole Miss offense to be elite this year now we don't know who's going to be playing quarterback I don't think their quarterback situation is in a bad state because you have three guys who are all capable of starting but from watching their spring game Spencer Rattler at least to me well not Spencer Rattler Spencer Sanders excuse me looked like the best quarterback for Ole Miss he transferred from Oklahoma State and he was one of the better quarterbacks in the Big 12. The problem with Spencer Sanders isn't talent. It's really just him being able to be consistent. Because when you watch Spencer Sanders play, his highs are really high. When he's at his best and he's on the fire, he's one of the best quarterbacks in college football. But his lows are really, really bad, man. When Spencer Sanders struggles, he turns the football over at a really high rate. He kind of ends up looking like a deer in headlights at times. Now him going to Lane Kiffin, who does a really good job at working with quarterbacks and elevating the player QBs, plus he's going to have a way better offensive line. When he was playing for Oklahoma State, man, this guy was running for his life back there behind that offensive line. Plus they didn't really have too much talent at wide receiver. So he's going to an Ole Miss team that is really good at wide receiver, has a fantastic offensive line. You're going to be getting coached up by one of the best offensive minds in college football right now in Lane Kiffin. So I think if Spencer Sanders ends up getting the start, Ole Miss is going to be really good. But if they end up going with Jackson Dart, I don't think they would be too bad. I definitely think he could end up improving going into his second season in that system. But those are the teams that I think are the most underrated going into this upcoming college football season, man. I really am banking on Texas A&M to be able to compete for the SEC West title this year. Kentucky, I definitely think they should end up bouncing back and going toe-to-toe with Tennessee for runner-up in the SEC West this year. But these are my most underrated teams in the SEC for the upcoming 2023 college football season. What can LA Charger fans expect from new offensive coordinator Kellen Moore? Now, Kellen Moore was the OC for the Dallas Cowboys for the past five seasons. And after last year, surprisingly, they got rid of him. And I feel like Mike McCarthy got rid of Kellen Moore in the scapegoat kind of fashion. Same way that the Buccaneers fired Byron Leftwich. Kellen Moore 
last season, this guy coached Dallas to having the top 10 offense. They were top 10 in damn near every statistical category. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to me why Dallas ended up firing him. And then you got Dallas Cowboy fans trying to put all of Dak Prescott's struggles all on Keller Moore. Like, you got to quit it, man. If you're a Dallas Cowboy fan, just own up and say that Mike McCarthy made a mistake moving on from Kellen Moore. Now, I think that the Cowboys offense is going to be perfectly fine, but I definitely think Dallas is going to take a step back offensively, and the LA Chargers offense is going to be better with Kellen Moore calling the plays than it was under their previous offensive coordinator and Joe Lombardi, who was able to put up 27 points in the first half against Jacksonville, and then in the second half just went completely blank. And all the knocks that Chargers fans had when it came to Joe Lombardi, his scheme being old school, not really being able to develop complex route combinations, you're not really going to have those same gripes when it comes to Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore is probably one of the most innovative offensive minds in the game right now. Many people expect him to end up becoming a head coach, whether that be at the NFL level or going back to the collegiate ranks. But Kellen Moore is one of the best offensive coordinators in the NFL. And now he's going to be having the opportunity to coach up one of the best QBs in the NFL, Justin Herbert, bro. Like, do you know what Kellen Moore's offense is going to do for Justin Herbert, bro? We're going to see all of Justin Herbert's full potential unleashed, man. And it seems like ever since Justin Herbert's days at Oregon, he's just been put in offenses that have held him back. Like, Joe Lombardi had a Ferrari, and he was trying to drive that thing like it was a damn Honda Civic, bro. Like, let this man, Justin Herbert, off the leash, man. Let Justin Herbert sling that rock, man. And that's one thing that Kellen Moore is going to let Justin Herbert do because something that Kellen Moore did a fantastic job at during his time calling plays for Dallas was getting big explosive plays in the passing game. His deep passing concepts are phenomenal, He also does a really good job at getting the best out of his personnel. Like, I was reading one article earlier before I started this episode of the podcast saying that, well, the wide receivers didn't really create much separation. Like, how can you put that on Kellen Moore? You can't put wide receivers being able to separate on the offensive coordinator. Eventually, you got to have players who can just downright execute. And outside of C.D. Lamb, Kellen Moore didn't really have any wide receivers who were good at that. Like, Michael Gallup was still trying to get back from that injury that he suffered the year prior. His route running was not that good. As a matter of fact, Michael Gallup took a step back in 2022, man. And then, not just that, but Dak Prescott was a turnover machine. This dude was giving out turnovers like it was Christmas. The only difference is for Dak Prescott, he was giving out those turnovers like it was Christmas Day every single day. He was looking like Santa Claus out there, man. And every time Dallas got into late game situations, Dak Prescott couldn't come through. Not just that, but he also was not making the proper reads. He was at times getting a little bit too conservative with the ball. Like, I believe that Kellen Moore getting fired was a scapegoat move by Mark McCarthy. It didn't really make too much sense, man. It just seemed like... The Dallas Cowboys had to put the blame on somebody. So they just went ahead and put the blame on Kellen Moore. This was somebody who was getting head coaching interviews, man. You don't get head coaching interviews if you're not good at what you do. So the LA Chargers got blessed to get an offensive coordinator this talented. He's going to have a fantastic wide receiver core to work with. Keenan Allen, when he's healthy, is one of the best slot receivers in the game. Mike Williams, it seems like this dude damn near catches everything, man. When you think about some of the best catches of last NFL season, Mike Williams accounted for a handful of them. Then you get Quinn Johnston, wide receiver out of TCU in the first round. Like These dudes have one of the biggest wide receiving cores in the NFL. Like Quinn Johnston has fantastic size, although he's a little bit weird. When you look at Quentin Johnston, you expect this dude to kind of have a similar play style to Mike Williams. But when you watch him play, he's a wide receiver that kind of plays more like he's a slot receiver at times. He's really good after the catch. He can make guys miss. 
Sometimes he can struggle getting off the line of scrimmage, but I believe in Kayla Moore's offense, this guy is going to be a big play waiting to happen every time Justin Fields targets him downfield, man. Like the best place for Quentin Johnston for me was him landing with the LA Chargers. He gets blessed with one of the best QBs in the game. He also has a fantastic offensive coordinator. Like, I'm expecting Quentin Johnston to have a fantastic rookie season for the LA Chargers, man. And then, Kellen Moore, earlier, when I was listening to one of his press conferences, and he was asked about Austin Eckler having his contract situation resolved, he was really excited about the opportunity to coach up Austin Eckler, man. This is one of the best all-around running backs in the NFL. And the run game was a big issue for the Chargers last season. They were one of the worst rushing football teams in the NFL last season. That was the main reason why they lost to the Jacksonville Jaguars because when they got up big after halftime, they couldn't take time off the clock. They were too one-dimensional on offense. They were too overly reliant on Justin Herbert. Plus, they had a good amount of injuries that kind of held them back. But if you're a Chargers fan, man, expect this offense to be amongst the best in the NFL. And just thinking about it now, I think that the Chargers... With Keller Moore, if he's as good as the offensive coordinator as many Chargers fans expect him to be, this is definitely a team that could end up going toe-to-toe with Kansas City legitimately for the AFC West this year, man. And that may be a little bit surprising to some. That may be a hot take to some people. But the Chargers do have a really talented football team, not just on the offense, but on the defensive side also. And if Brandon Staley can finally get that defense performing at the level that it should be under him with him being a defensive-minded coach, you couple that with the fact that they now have a legitimate elite offensive coordinator at the helm, the Chargers probably could be a dark horse Super Bowl contender. And if you're a Chiefs fan, you better watch out. Because the Chargers, right now, this team is a little scary. You got wide receivers, you got quarterback, you're going to have a really good offensive line as long as everybody can stay healthy, and now they have a legitimate offensive coordinator now calling the plays, man. I mean, this was somebody who had Dallas backup QB, Cooper Rush, looking pretty good. With Cooper Rush at the helm at QB last season when Dak Prescott had missed a couple of games due to injury, they went 4-1 and with him as the starter. You don't do that if you have a terrible offensive coordinator. Now, I'm not saying that Cooper Rush was lighting the world on fire under Kellen Moore, but this dude was way better than what I initially expected him to be as the starting quarterback and replaced with Dak Prescott until he came back fully healthy. And then even then, Dak Prescott has some really good moments and some really good games under Kellen Moore. The problem is that Dak Prescott, just for some reason last season, he just was too careless with the football. And yet, I don't get how that was Kellen Moore's fault, man. Like, Kellen Moore with Justin Herbert, bro, they're going to be cooking up some legitimate dimes downfield, bro. This dude has one of the best passing games, one of the best passing schemes in the NFL when it comes to generating big plays downfield and that's something that Justin Herbert has really been allowed to do not just during his time being the starting QB for the LA Chargers but even back to his college days when he was playing at Oregon he now has an offensive coordinator that truly understands Justin Herbert's skill set that never made any sense to me how Joe Lombardi had a quarterback that had one of the strongest arms in the NFL, but yet he never allowed this guy to let it loose. Plus, his scheme was old school in a lot of Chargers fans' eyes. So now you have an offensive coordinator and Kellen Moore who's going to be running a modern-day offense. This is also somebody that makes pretty good adjustments. That was another thing that Joe Lombardi struggled to do. He struggled to really adapt his offense. He kind of was out of touch. I'm surprised that the Chargers offense performed at the way that it did last season, good enough to make it to the postseason. We probably could give Justin Herbert the majority of the credit for that. But for Kelly Moore, man, he has the perfect opportunity to get a head coaching job with the team that he has in L.A., Justin Herbert, one of the best QBs in the game. You have one of the best receiving cores in the game. You're going to have a really good offensive line. The Chargers offense should at least be top five, no worse than top eight in the NFL this season. And when this offense starts cooking up dimes downfield, 
they're going to be a really scary team that if you're opposing defensive coordinator, you're going to have a hard time game planning for Mike Williams, Quentin Johnston, and Keenan Allen. Kellen Moore, this is the perfect opportunity this season for him to prove himself, not just as a legitimate offensive coordinator, but also he probably could catapult himself into being a potential head coaching candidate next season. So let me know how you guys feel about the L.A. Chargers offense going into this season with new offensive coordinator Kellen Moore. And this is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast, man. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you haven't already, make sure that you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. We live stream Monday through Friday every day at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Listen to the JT Sports Podcast, available on all podcasting platforms. Give us a five-star review if you enjoyed. Share this podcast on your social media platforms with your friends, family members, and acquaintances. And I will see you guys Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.